Thank you so much for joining me on my program once again. I appreciate you wherever you are joining me from. I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Accept my greeting according to your time zone. If you have not subscribed to my channel, please kindly subscribe to my channel. Click the notification bell so that you'll be notified each time I upload a video. You can be among the first to receive it. Then go to the comment section at all time. Leave your comment. Drop your contribution. If you have suggestions, make it out there. If you have any criticism, put it down on the comment section. It will make us to get better. Presenting you a better program. Uh, Mr. Ogbaudu, uh, you know, one of the issues that uh, you just heard uh, Mr. Onanugo raise now is that indeed because the police or security agencies want to seem as though, okay, they've got things covered, then they come up with that messaging. But behind the scenes, uh, when it's time to make policies or influence policy making, law making, do they lay these things bare and say, well, I mean, these laws are not helpful. Is that something that maybe you experienced during your time? So, yes, it's important to have the show of force. But in reality, if the laws are not, or the punishments uh, are not enough uh, to prevent, by the way, my colleague was saying the primary responsibility is to prevent, not as though that's the only responsibility. Then when that is missed, they can escalate uh, to fighting and all of that. But behind the scenes do we have security agencies the police maybe primarily raising this issue saying the laws are not working we need to tweak this law so that there is more deterrent i don't know about the capital punishment for firearm possession but in that line really sorry let me give you another example of deterrence where deterrence works when peter obi was governor of a number of states he contained kidnapping how did he do it if a kidnap victim is traced to your house. The governor himself at that time, Mr. Peter B himself, will go with the police officers with uh, caterpillars, bulldozers, and all of that, and the building will be brought down after the, the suspects have been rescued. And to a very large extent, that solved kidnapping problem in Alhambra State. And that was a major achievement in terms of deterrence. We're in a country where we don't talk about equality before the law. We talk about inequality before the law. And it's not helping us. It's not taking us anywhere. So let me just mention something that is not directly related to what I'm saying here. When you drive on the roads, on our streets here in Abuja, for instance, you see some political appointees, elected officers. Their plate numbers are covered with black, black nylon. And in those vehicles, you even find police officers, policemen there. Now, the question is, why will somebody cover his plate number? If you are an ordinary citizen and you cover your plate number, the police, I'm sure, will arrest you, will arrest you. You might be accused of wanting to use the vehicle for some criminal activities so that when you succeed and all of that, your vehicle number will not be known. But yet, some of these guys are up there are doing things like that. You know, so we really need to re-strategize, change our modus operandi, whatever we do in this country. Doing the same thing the same way over and over and expecting different results, it doesn't work. It won't give us any results. We must change our modus operandi. Speaking of doing things differently, okay. Mr. Ogbodo, and still on the, the, the wavelength of deterrence, um, after the elections, the conclusion of the process, the Inspector General of Police had said that uh, over 700 uh, persons were arrested for electoral violence. How strong is is that is, a, is is that a statement of deterrence to those who are perpetrating electoral violence from your own point of view uh what should be done you know to take that up uh to, to, to as a statement of deterrence to those who may want to perpetrate electoral violence in the future well um one thing must understand is this regrettably those who use these guys as thugs their children are not part of them. Their children are not part of them. I recall when I was Commissioner of Police in Gombe State, way back 2003. Just before the election at that time, I addressed the public on TV and on radio and all of that. I remember the meetings we held. And I told the youths, I said, look, if anybody comes to you to say, come and be a thug for me, tell him, sir, I hope your children are going to join us. And some of the policemen came to me and said, ah, Sipi, so you want my child? I said, oh, so your child cannot do that. But you want somebody else's child to do that? 
we need to enlighten them. We need to educate them. We also need to uh, encompass a lot of these things in the school curriculum from the primary to even up to university level. We need to tell them their do's and their don'ts and the consequences. All of this will go a long way in reshaping our society. So it's, uh, it's, there's so much we need to do. When I talked about public enlightenment, sensitization, that can be extended to the churches, in the mosques, in the social electronic media, you know, in town hall meetings, in uh, banners or billboards here and there, telling people what not to do, and if you do it this word, you get there's a consequence. Because we are not doing much in that regard. A lot of people still think that they can do anything and get away with it. And they don't see anything wrong with what they are doing. Forgetting that, they are breaching the laws. And that's why there's so much insecurity. The back to the statement you, you said the police used to make. That sounds like a broken record. So I'm not concerned. The, the Something happens today, tomorrow is so you are talking about the situation. Beyond the enlightenment, like the Mr. Gwadu, 700 uh, is quite a number. And uh, you, of this, most of we have members. 18 political yeah. parties you know that. that participated in the presidential election and even much more at the governorship level. Uh, shouldn't we move beyond the enlightenment, you know, uh, if we're, we're going to... Should we, shouldn't we move to a culture of naming and shaming? Look, let me... Let, sorry, I, I, almost, uh, I almost forgot that question, the issue you raised about the arrest of over 700 persons during the election period. We have a problem with the process of prosecuting suspects in this country. You'll be shocked that after three, four, five, six months, nobody will hear about those cases anymore. Cases will be adjourned here and there. Some lawyers will be going there to defend the indefensible, you know, justify the unjustifiable in court and all of that. All of these are compounding our problems. So if we can have a judiciary that attend to criminal offenses timelessly, it will also go a very long way to solve this problem we're talking about now. It's not just enough to come and say on a daily basis, you're on top of the situation. It's a situation that's always on top of you. You are claiming you're on top of it. And nothing is changing. No, by somebody. This whole um, mix of, as you said, our prosecution process, and they continue to fester their virus on the general public or the society. And um, they seem to have also taken down the criminal justice administration systems. Because if you look around, you'll find that, for instance, um, I can say confidently that over 40% of our security men are guarding few elements in our society, mostly political office holders and private citizens, rather than protecting the communities. And um, you will also find situations where you walk into an office, uh, the man there does not have a future. The wage he takes home cannot address the needs and the challenges he faces, house rent, feeding, medicals, no functional facilities. So, you see, it's generic. Now we are looking at developing people in this kind of environment. What kind of people do you think you are going to make out of them? It's impossible to uh, have an insecure man, like I would always say, provide security for you. People are financially insecure. They are socially insecure. Now we have other threats eating into it. They can't even express themselves. We just had a, an election, and the reactions coming from the election shows that people, some section of the people were not satisfied, some felt disenfranchised. Even from the point of picking up PVCs, people felt that there were deliberate collusions and attempts by certain people to stop them from accessing their PVCs that would have helped them to make choices of who they make their leader and who makes decisions and manages their resources. So we are looking at poverty. Poverty not only being weaponized, poverty has become a vehicle driving the entire nation to our doom. People are not only poor that they don't have money, they have no regards for rule of law. They have absolute contempt for the lives and properties of others. You know, drug uh, has also taken a place in the society. Now, 
I'm going to touch the issue of the drugs because narcotics seems to be a free for all. If you go to check out some of the bandits, they live on drugs. How do they get these drugs? Where do they source them from? Which, which routes do they take to bring them into the country? And we have our borders. They are porous. The customs are doing their best. The immigrations are putting on. But listen, these same people are taken from here. If you go and assess the wealth of an average public officer, I can tell you, 60% of what they have did not come from their work. It came from alternative sources, which are not legitimate. So if we have to deal with it, I think it's time we sat down and begin to address the issue of merit. Where we have to allocate opportunities and uh, benefits, rather than um, vest our future on people with character, people that, you know, by merit qualifies to do those assignments, we also have to look at this. I'm looking at the solutions because we cannot enumerate the insecurity challenges and what goes with it just in sitting in one place. I can tell you that most of the public officers might not be even listening to what we're saying. They're not interested. Mr. The man is there hoping to make his own here, ends. If I may come in here, and both of you have to weigh in on this. You talked about poverty and um, weaponized poverty. So let's just say poverty of the mind, poverty of money, poverty of money, poverty of, mora of morals, poverty of... Um, appreciation for life well so generalizing poverty as here poverty as it is but does that negate the laws as they are right now because many will say our laws need to be amended our laws need to be amended but as the laws are you a security expert um the barrister about to hear a lawyer and a security expert as well so does poverty negate the laws? How do we begin to enforce the laws as they are to the point that these violent attacks are curbed and ended once and for all? The, the fact is that poverty comes with mental health issues. And you don't make laws for a madman. You can only make laws for a responsible, sane human being. A poor man is worse than a lunatic because he grabs any opportunity he sees opportunities as lifelines that's why people could sell for instance their pvcs or their votes for just mere two thousand naira when trillions are going to be budgeted across years for the development of the society poverty is worse than any disease we can imagine and except those in authority begins to see the consequence and realign themselves because these are agents of destruction in some sense where they are supposed to be builders of society their morals cannot carry the assignments they are given to do so you see them compromise on basic values you see them compromise on key components of public service that could have helped people to align and behave better so when you have those things away, and it's driven by poverty, if I don't know the value of clean water, I will assume that taking just any water will serve my thirst or quench my thirst. Now, the after effect is that I will contract diseases and sicknesses that could take or terminate my life. So that is the problem with okay. poverty. And the type of poverty we have in Nigeria is not only chronic, it's demonic. It's human induced. Uh, Go ahead. No, Mr. Nobu, I, I just wanted to let you know. Let me bring it here to uh, Barrister Obaldu uh, so we can see you guys in Lagos. All right, let's wind up, Mr. Nobu, uh, two issues. Uh, one is coming up today. The NGF will be discussing security votes. Uh, they'll be meeting with uh, agencies, EFCC and the rest. So it speaks to the fact that there's actually some sort of funding for security, whether or not it's done well. Is another case entirely, and I wonder what you'll be asking them to do about the security vote, which has been largely shrouded in secrecy. And just to add, I saw a post you put up in September 2021 saying you deeply sympathize with the individual who shall be taking over the saddles of leadership after PMB. And you went on to talk about some issues. Uh, merge that together because the security vote also spills over into the next administration anyway. Uh, yes, um, I, I like to put it in this way. Funds will not solve the insecurity problems in Nigeria. 
we need to begin to look at what kind of resources should we put on ground? What kind of opportunities should we create to accommodate generations of Nigerians who are developing their skills, their talents, and their capacity to engage? In the absence of effective management of these people, they will be... The Igbo. He made the following remarks. Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. The Igbo domination mantra and general dislike for the Igbo whom the British and everyone else felt were too loud and proud, somewhat became a uniting factor in pre-independence Nigeria and post-independence Nigeria, among the various ethnic nationalities in Nigeria, but more potent in the North. One of the results of the pre-independence pieces of evidence of why Igbos are hated in Nigeria was the Joss riot of 1945 and the killing of Ndi Igbo which was as a result of increased tension between the Northerners and the Easterners, a product of the Igbo domination and encroachment sentiment in the North. Another was the massacre of Igbo coal miners in Enugu on 18th November 1949 by Northern soldiers under the command of British officers. 21 Igbo men were shot dead, while 51 others sustained injuries. The next time the Igbo were killed in Nigeria was in 1953 in Kano. For no fault of theirs, but only being present in a great number in Kano, the Northern mob invaded Sabongiri and slaughtered Ndigo and destroyed their properties. This particular violence and massacre of Easterners were planned and coordinated by Malam Inu Awada of the Northern People's Congress NPC the political party that evolved from the native authority administration. His reason for unleashing local government security officials and the mob on the Easterners was because Chief Akintola's action group party booed and abused the northern members of the NPC in Lagos, and Akintola was planning to come to Kano. Malam Inu Awada and his people wanted to revenge against the Yoruba but somehow ended up killing Igbo people who had nothing to do with the differences between the NPC and the action group who never showed up in Kano. This also is another evidence of why Igbos are hated in Nigeria because if not for sheer hate and disdain, why would the northern mob organized to harass Chief Akintola and his people turn on the Igbo, kill them and destroy their properties? The hostilities against the Igbo in Nigeria would continue till after independence. The 1966 coup of January led by Major Chuku Manzogu was the perfect ignition to the time bomb that had been taken in Nigeria. The coup was an excuse to unleash genocide against the Igbo. And by 1971, the genocide which lasted four years had taken more than 3 million Igbo lives. The first year, 1966, saw over 100,000 Igbo being killed in various pogroms in the north, while 1967 to 1971 saw millions killed in the Biafran War. In the three to four years of the war, history saw the whole of Nigeria the House of Fulani, the Yoruba, the Thief, the Idoma, the Benin, and other ethnic nationalities turned against the Igbo and attempted to wipe them from the face of the earth in what would be described as an African Holocaust. After the war, which was fought to stop the Igbo from leaving the Nigerian state, the Igbo who wanted their nation were forced to return to the Federation called Nigeria, but were never fully welcomed back into the nation.
what they faced after the war was economic ostracization, political marginalization, and social bullying. This marginalization, which is a precipitate of the Igbo phobia in Nigeria, is still present to date. 30 mass killings from 1945 till date that prove Igbo phobia and why Igbos are hated. It is very easy for an average non Igbo Nigerian to say that the Igbo are not hated in Nigeria and that their cry of marginalization and suppression is simply a victimhood mentality. The truth is that whoever is of that opinion is outright dubious and hates to hear the truth or even speak the truth. There are over 100 years of evidence to prove that the Igbo are hated in Nigeria and are only being tolerated in most cases. A clear example is the number of times the Igbo have been attacked and killed in various